I think the move to data politics as an area of research is going to be very interesting in that regard. You know, how communities use data to mobilize and Mm. to work towards um, social justice or spatial justice. It focuses on the politics of data. It's data, not data. But it's, you know, who, who collects data, who processes it, how does it get represented, and in the way that it gets represented, whose interests does it serve? Does it tell the whole story? Does it actually, is it quite selective in the story that it tells? Hi, Smart Community friends. In this episode of the Smart Community Podcast, I have a brilliant conversation with Nancy Odendahl, who you may remember from way back in episode three, back when we were called the Smart City Podcast. Nancy is a professor of city and regional planning at the University of Cape Town and has been in this smart city space for decades. In this episode, Nancy and I discuss what smart community means to her and her research in Cape Town during the pandemic. We talk about data politics and how they relate to the city, city systems and infrastructure management. Nancy then tells us about her book, Disrupted Urbanism, Situated Smartness Initiatives in African Cities, why she wrote it and some of the lessons from it as well. We discuss the importance of co-designing and co-creating the smart city with the community and the emerging trends of interpreting AI or artificial intelligence from a more localised community perspective. We finish our chat discussing the move towards a hybrid of old-fashioned offline community approaches combined with technological solutions as the next step in smart communities. As always, we hope you enjoy listening to this episode as much as we enjoy making it. Welcome to the smart community, smart regions, smart towns, and smart cities. It's where we live, work, and play with smart communities. The future starts today. Big data, smart mobility, emerging trends galore. The Smart Community Podcast is what you're looking for. Hello, Nancy. How are you today? Hey, Zoe. Hello. I'm very well. Thank you. It's still early in Cape Town. I'm having my coffee while I'm talking to you. Well, thank you so much for getting up early for us. Um, I am very excited to have you on the podcast. You have been on before. You were actually episode number three. Can you believe it? Um, Because (laughs) we are up to, now I have to test my knowledge, the last episode that came out was 345. Oh, that's fantastic. Congratulations, you. That's Thank wonderful. You. Yeah, it's been a time. So your episode was released uh, in 2018, which feels like a lifetime ago. Uh, it really does. <laughs> it and really then does. we hung then we hung out in person in 2019 before we the did. pandemic. Cape Town. I exposed which... you to my cooking and you survived. <laughs> it was so good. What a, what a dream that was. Anyway, okay, enough about me. Let's jump into this. Okay, so welcome back to the podcast. So for those who don't know you, can you tell us about your background and what you're passionate about? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. So I am a professor of city and regional planning at the University of Cape Town. So I trained as a planner and I became interested in technology and planning before I became a planner, actually. I worked as a sort of technical planner and worked in GIS mostly and CAD. Um, So I guess I was always quite fascinated by the technological innovations that underpinned planning practice. And then when I became an academic, I sort of realized that this was in 2001. I realized that the whole digital city, what it was then called, or smart city in some cases, was becoming quite a big debate. So I decided to kind of go down that road. So yes, I'm passionate about cities. I love walking cities. I love studying cities. I love um, getting under the skin of cities. And I love the way that information technology tools and or just smart platforms have enabled us to 
see different dimensions of the city emerge. So yeah, and um, yeah, and I live in Cape Town, and I'm an ocean swimmer. <laughs> That's awesome. And I remember in our conversation way back in 2018. You've been in this space for a long time, you know, before it was called Smart Cities, as you said. So, yeah, I'm keen to, I guess, explore a little bit about how it's changed. But we'll start with, firstly, well, we talk about smart communities on the Smart Community Podcast. Mm -hmm. Actually, when you were on the podcast last, it was called the Smart City Podcast. So there's already been an, an evolution. But tell us broadly what a smart community means to you. To me, a smart community is is obviously a connected community. It's a community that uh, contains members that are in touch with each other on an ongoing basis. And it's often to do with a number of, of issues. It can be issue-based. It can be simply because of geography, you know, people living in one street and kind of looking out for each other. But I think what technology has done, what smart technologies have done, has enabled us to to expand the geographic reach of community to span, you know, to span geographies and space. So what I found, I did some research on smart communities, I guess you would call them during the pandemic, when neighborhoods in Cape Town got together and essentially started mobilizing to harness resources and and to also look after each other. So to me, it's very much, yeah, smart communities aren't just dependent on technology or smart technologies, they're often hybrids. You know, it's often a mix of communication tools and social connections and livelihood strategies. And it's quite a mixed bag and it differs from place to place. So I think the whole notion of smart community is is a very interesting one. I think it's often very much informed by place. And as a city planner, I find that very interesting. I really like that. I think the connected piece is really important, but not just the digital connection as you Mm. spoke about, but that, you know, we're connected in a human, you know, social way. And I think the pandemic did really like bring out those factors of looking after each other. And, uh, you know, and I still think some of those you know, we're still discovering some of those things that happened during the pandemic that we just kind of I think we know, are. Did, right? I think yeah. we are. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. I think we really are. I think we we're still trying to come to grips with it. And I think we're also just all sort of suffering from post traumatic stress disorder. I think we're still trying to kind of figure it out for ourselves, you know. Um, mm. and uh what definitely emerged for me in the work that I did was the importance of social networks. Or social capital, where, you know, I mean, we were forced to rely on, in this case, WhatsApp groups and, you know, sort of quite basic tools, actually, that enables people to get enrolled into these initiatives quite easily. But at the end of the day, it really did come back to kind of face-to-face relationships that formed the kind of the crux, you know. I mean, not to say that things like digital communities do not exist. They do. I mean, you know, social media is is testimony to that. But I'm more interested in how people galvanize in conditions of uncertainty and scarcity. And I don't think that's just, you know, that's just relevant to Cape Town. I think what the pandemic, or to South Africa, or indeed the global South, I think the pandemic revealed that there are margins everywhere. And, uh, yeah, so... No, it's been quite interesting work. And I think it is work that's evolving still. And I think the the move to data politics as an area of research is going to be very interesting in that regard. You know, how how communities use data to mobilize and Mm. to work towards um, social justice or spatial justice. And to me, that's been one of the biggest shifts in the last couple of years is the emphasis on data. And obviously the whole open data movement is, is interesting in that regard. Yeah. Mm. So say more about data politics. So data politics is a really interesting area of work that's beginning to gel. And it really, it focuses on the politics of data. It's data, not data. Um, <laughs> but it's, you know, who who collects data, who processes it, how does it get represented, 
And in the way that it gets represented, whose interests does it serve? Does it tell the whole story? Does it actually, is it quite selective in the story that it tells? I mean, to me, that one of the most brilliant books that I think gives us quite a kind of a layered look into data politics is the book Data Feminism. And, you know, where the authors are fantastic because it's a great book because it, the authors go through essentially, I think it's 10 principles that inform or that could inform a sort of feminist lens on data. And they kind of come from an intersectional approach. So they you know, essentially say, you know, data feminism is good for everybody. <laughs> mm. it's, um, but I mean, some of the principles that they emphasize are around contextuality understanding kind of more qualitative approaches to how data is collected and represented. So there's, I guess, the activist kind of space, but there's also the kind of institutional space where data can be used to reinforce a particular political stand. And um, yeah, so I think it's a very interesting field of work and I think super, super relevant. And I think we just, you know, it's just beginning to kind of mature as a literature and a really important debate to have, especially as we start talking about AI more and, you know, sort of what data gets fed into a model and and how do we, I mean, you're a data, a data scientist, so, you know, you probably understand the nuts and bolts of it much better than I do. But I think there's an interesting the interesting ways in which we can kind of look at the relationship between between data and artificial intelligence and political ideologies. I mean, we know this, again, from the pandemic and from the sort of some of the kind of political, especially some of the kind of right-wing movements in the U.S., for example. So well, it's a, I think yeah. they, you know, um, yeah, And I guess my work is more to do with how that relates back to the city and how people experience the city and city management and so forth. And yeah, and you can't separate those two things out, right? And like they're intertwined and, and they have to be like cities use data and they have for hundreds of mm. thousands of years or, or absolutely. Whatever. Yeah. Um, but now there's more of it and it's digitized and it's accessible in a different way in the sense of who makes decisions with it and those type of mm. things, or how much of it you're using. And when I was doing my masters the ethical kind of decision making was something that really interested me and mm. even when I did my Churchill fellowship and I don't know whether we talked about this I we I'm sure we did mm. one of my biggest like takeaways which was you know not intended was that me being a woman traveling alone affected my ability to research mobility because you know yeah, I was, yeah you know yeah. and and things like that and obviously that's not just about data but it's about the experience of women and marginalised people and, and how that mm. then that intersectionality then kind of, kind of compounds of the different groups and how that they experience you know, mobility mm. and things like that. But, yeah, what data, how data actually feeds into that as well. And one of the things mm. in my master's I realised was even if you don't, you know, some things are quite obvious. Well, they're obvious now, I suppose, but, like, you know, if you feed mm. in resumes of 100 successful applicants of the last mm. 10 years in the tech industry, for example, most of them will be male. Therefore, you know, you're preferencing a model, you know, if you feed that yes. into a model, you're preferencing yes. a model. Yeah. Again, yeah. obvious in inverted commas because, you know, we know that it's happened. But things like even just the decisions I had to make um, when I was doing statistical analysis, which had nothing to do with who the data was about or whatever, but the decisions I mm. made based on what model I decided to use, what factors I decided to use, because exactly. I would see the answer, right? And I would go, oh, well, that might slightly lean towards my bias or I don't want it to, I don't want to seem biased, so I'm going to go the complete opposite way. Mm, I just, mm. I was doing a, a project uh, like a, you know, in my master's about, I can't remember exactly, but it was around weight and height and like growth of uh, girls mm. based on like a whole range of factors or something in a country. Uh, again, probably simulated data. But, yeah, you then chose, what, oh, well, you know, I want to show that there's a problem 
so mm. I want, you know, mm. or whatever the case is. So Yeah, it, it does bias it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, um, I was at the, the Science and Technology Studies big conference 4S in Mexico last year, and there was there were at least, I mean, I, I must have gone to about, you know, five sessions that looked at data politics in some, you know, maybe it didn't call it that. But I mean, I do believe that it's, you know, it also relates to infrastructure management and the city systems. And it's completely, you know, how do you bias? Is, are there certain neighborhoods that are, are, are kind of favored because of the way that, that, that systems are set up and data collection is set up and, you know, or, and, and or are more, they available? Or more enforced, you know, certain things yeah, are more enforced yeah, in yeah, certain areas. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And like, you know, if, depending on how what it is that you're looking at, but like you might install more technology mm. in a certain area to service it better, yeah. or you might install, you know, to then have more enforcement mm. or whatever the case is, or you yeah. go, oh, make yeah. sure you collect data on this. And, mm. you know, those mm. decisions might not be even conscious, but no, they, might even not come from, yeah. no, they might not <laughs> even come from the top, right? They might just be, oh, mm. well, mm. John on the ground works near this space, so he collects data, you know, mm. whatever it is, mm. you know, there's so mm. many different mm factors so yeah I do find that fascinating well okay let's talk about your book tell us oh thank you about it because (laughs) I'm excited and I'm excited to read it so yeah tell Mm. us thank you so this was a pandemic project actually I worked on the proposal during the hard lockdown I was ensconced in a in a rather nice apartment in Johannesburg with my then partner, and I thought, well, this is my moment <laughs> to work on it. And I, and I was also on sabbatical, um, which was nice. So the book is essentially a consolidation of a lot of work that I've been doing over the last, I, I guess, five to eight years, and it's called Disrupted Urbanism: Situated Smart in- Initiatives in African Cities. And essentially, what I do is I look at I look at digital platforms and how they're used as a resource, but also how they are created in several African cities. And the premise of the book is essentially the question, you know, if smart cities are so great, (laughs) and if they, you know, they tout it as being the solution for just about everything, what do they promise? And do they deliver on their promises? And the first chapter, the first two chapters pretty much say they don't really. And then I sort of ask the question, well, how, what's the real smart city? What does the real smart city look like in Africa? I mean, I can't generalize too much. It's a big continent, but I sort of went to quite a lot of it. (laughs) And then I organized the book in a number of themes that relate to urban issues. So I I have a, a chapter on mobility, one on food security, another on civil society and social mobilization, another on public culture. And then I use these themes to look at essentially stories of digital platform use and appropriation in several African cities. So, for example, in the mobility chapter, I look at an app called Safe Border, which is an app that was created in Uganda for border border bicycle, um, uh, motorcycle taxis. So these are essentially informal forms of transport motorcycle taxis that get used sort of quite extensively in Kampala and the other lots of other cities in East Africa. In um, the food security chapter, I mean, I look at a couple of other vignettes as well. Food security chapter, I look at a an app that connects um, small-scale farmers with informal traders uh, or vendors, you might call them, in Nairobi. So that's a Kenyan example. Look at other couple of examples as well, including the use of drones to look at climate change and the impact on food security in Zanzibar. And then uh, the social mobilization chapter, I use quite a lot of South African case studies. And the one that I focus quite heavily on is the um, community action network movement during the pandemic in Cape Town, where which was what I've described before, these kind of neighborhood-based organizations or neighborhood-based groups, networks, not even, they're definitely not organizations that mobilized using platform technologies. And then public culture, I sort of look at Afrofuturism, but I also look at, you know, as as a kind of way of looking into the future. And then the conclusion of the book is basically to say that the smart city exists in many different ways, many different um, iterations, and that platform technologies has enabled 
an even more granular sort of landing of smart technologies because of the the, the way that digital platforms are are constructed, you know, the way that they allow for expansion. But yet, you know, there's obviously again issues about data ownership um, and so forth. And so it's very much a kind of, uh, I guess, a socio-technical reading of the the African smart city in a very granular way. And yeah, so it's full of stories. It's Mm. full of stories, but then it sort of gets heavy towards the end where it concludes on, you know, on some particular themes around what I think the African smart city is. Why was it important for you to write this book? I felt I wanted to consolidate my work. I also had a number of colleagues, you know, academic colleagues, largely from overseas, <laughs> who said to me, you know, you've got quite a particular argument that I, I sort of develop in various journal articles and book chapters. But I sort of felt it really important to consolidate it into an, a monograph. And I also felt that the book format allowed me to sort of play a bit, you know, to use Mm. some of these examples to think about some ideas and, you know, sort of like the last, the the public culture chapter, you know, sort of play with the idea of Afrofuturism, you know, what could that mean? What does that tell us about the the imagination around technologies and cities? So it allows a little bit of more space to play with ideas, but it is also a big consolidation exercise and also just enjoy writing. There's something really satisfying about putting a book together. It's a very, it's quite a private space if you do it on your own. And it's quite a intellectually very, very satisfying. Yeah, cool. So uh, I guess what I'm keen to understand, I mean, I love stories because it makes it real. And I think we need more stories in these, you know, books because it's all well and good to be very theoretical, but people, well, mm. we want to know where are people. And again, it's like you won't necessarily find a story that proves every single point or whatever, but it's Absolutely. those little iterations. And mm. I think that's really important. And I'm also like the smart city that's failed. What, what, and the smart city that we want to succeed, what are the features that are different in the like failed version versus the yeah. smart community or, you know, the more kind of people focused city that we need? I, yeah, no, no, no. It's a great question, actually. And it's one I explore quite extensively in the book. The problem with the smart city as it's projected in the media and also often by many governments and, you know, sort of states. Is that it's it's quite a an idealized um, sort of end result focused look um, at the so called ideal city um, in terms of it being quite frictionless everything works according to um, sort of centrally um, organized systems. Um, the it's sort of it's portrayed as a nirvana of sorts um this 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 frictionless um utopia uh, full of shiny buildings <laughs> and um you know sort of non interrupted infrastructure um and it's very it's a feature of city planning history actually um to to sort of indulge in these utopian ideals and portray that as something we should walk work towards. It's not the first time it's happened. Um, mm. I mean, if you look at at you know 1930s modernism, if you looked at 1960s, the height of cyber cybernetics and um, the second generation of new towns that were developed, it was all based on this ideal of the perfect city. And I think I think the smart city is a recent iteration of that. The difference now is that it's being pushed obviously by big multinational tech companies who clearly have a a market interest in pushing smart cities because you know who's gonna process all that data or data. You know. <laughs> and but I think I don't want to say it's all bad, but you know I, 
there's a lot in that representation of smart cities that's actually quite interesting in respect, of, especially with regards to infrastructure management and infrastructure design. I think there's a lot, you know, there's, there's some good stuff, but when you use that, I mean, the other thing about this notion of the, you know, the smart city that works as a package is that there's also a general assumption that it will all work the same way in the, in different places. I think mm. I think there's an a contextual or a sort of sort of placelessness to it that I find I've always found very disturbing, and I'm not the only one that that does. And where the smart city actually does hit the ground, like in the African context, there's a couple of smart neighborhoods being developed in Rwanda, in Kenya. There's one in Tanzania as well. It's and and the, the very famous one is in in Lagos, just off the coast of Lagos and Eco Atlantic, which was never not initially marketed mm-hmm. as a smart city, but it soon became that in, in the marketing literature. Is that it's got nothing to do with the real city. It's often it's top down. It often involves partnerships between multinational engineering firms, tech companies, and state you know sort of central governments. There's very little consultation with local communities or indeed just with city communities. And I mean, the India example is, is particularly good. And this is where Ayona Datta and Viganta Das, these are two names that have two folks, uh, two friends of mine who have written about the Indian smart city drive by the Modi regime. In India. And, and, you know, what they've highlighted in their research is some quite devastating impacts on local neighborhoods and people. You know, quite often also the implementation of what are essentially new town developments lead to removal of um, informal settlements, for example, where people live. <laughs> and then, of course, there's a, there's a lot of literature on Songdo in, in, in Korea, South Korea. Yes, um, I have been there. Uh, and you I was been like... there, so you could probably say more about that. <laughs> well, it was a while ago now, but I was like, but where are the people at? Exactly. Yeah. Um, but it was yeah. all, it's also quite old now. Like, you know, the technology they used was yeah, 2007. Yeah. But no, I, no, absolutely. And um, it was interesting. I watched a video on it a few years ago now where it was like it's actually starting to become its own, you know, it started its own culture because. Yeah. 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 So it's, it, it is interesting. But yeah, I, mm. I think, like, I agree. I think the, the smart city as, oh, here's a packaged. Here's the package, mm. just install this and you now you've got a smart city. Mm. Has never yeah. been yeah, has never sat with me very well and ever. Mm. Like and I just think there's so much substance underneath it where we, you know, we can use technology and data as actual tools to make better decisions. Absolutely. But yeah, if you don't include the people, like co-design is just so, you know, whatever word you want to use, but like that consultation mm. with the community mm. is so important. And it's also about, well, what works with that community, not the other mm-hmm. way around, mm-hmm. like, oh, well, this community no longer works with my new smart city that I'm building, which, yeah, is, yeah. which is, you know, the opposite of what we're, you know, what we want. Mm. So, yeah. Absolutely. It, I mean, it is the opposite of what we want. And, I mean, you were asking me to contrast the two, you know, what, what I think, you know, about the pre-designed city versus the kind of smart community. There's, there's there's some really interesting initiatives, I think, where the state, often local government, works together with resident communities in developing kind of smart systems that could kind of benefit them. And I, so I don't want to sort of give the, you know, sort of give the impression that I'm anti, you know, sort of state-led smart initiatives. I think it can be done very sensitively and very interestingly. And I think, I think, you know, people sort of often read my work as, you know, I'm the person who writes about the bottom up stuff. And, and I guess I am. <laughs> but, um, and it's got a lot to do with where I'm situated in, in the global south. But, but I do believe that there's some really interesting work that can be done on the in between, you know, mm-hmm. the in between, you know, how, how can we look at sort of state community partnerships using smart technologies? And how can we yeah, sort of take an approach which doesn't use technology as the dividing line between skilled and unskilled, if you know what I mean, where where people who, you know, use WhatsApp groups in particular ways, people who use Twitter in particular ways, you know, how, how can we sort of use that as a kind of resource or as a kind of form of connection in 
in, in new projects and new ideas. And so I, I kind of, I'm quite, I'm quite taken with the notion of co-creation, actually. I think it's a great word, Zoe, you know, of using ways through which we can kind of find new ways of working together that involves, a smart, te- involves smart technologies. I think there's, there's a great scope for that. I mean, I've been doing a lot of work in that space and it's like nice. getting also because the general population and particularly people that a place has not been designed for ask great questions about what technology can and cannot do for them or what they do and do not mm. want it to do and what they feel and don't feel about a space or, or all those mm. type of things. And mm. so you just, and when it's genuine co, like co-design and co-creation, then yeah, you can get some really good outcomes. Yeah, but it's the questioning yeah. that I just find fascinating. Also, being allowed to ask mm. those questions, like opening up that dialogue, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. is really important too. So yeah, yeah, I think it is, and I think it's you know it's so much more interesting and creative than coming up with a blanket approach and. I think the blanket approach or the kind of top-down approach somehow sometimes just seems easier, you know, to policymakers. You know, it's like, yeah. it's you know, there's less, I'm using the word friction again, you know, there's less friction. <laughs> yeah. But in democracies, there often is more friction. People mm. will say, no, hang on a minute. <laughs> yeah. We don't work? want this. Yeah. <laughs> mm. yeah. Well, I'm just looking at the time. It's, we could talk for hours, I think. But oh, I do want. I, I do oh want goodness, to. Zoom. How did that happen? I oh. know. I do want to zoom to the future, and I want to talk about where to next. So, sure. are you happy to zoom to the future mm-hmm. and talk about Absolutely. some of the emerging emerging trends that people aren't talking about enough? I think there's a there's quite a, a lot of hoo ha about AI, and and I must say I'm a little bit behind on my reading on on artificial intelligence. And and obviously, as an academic, you know, there's a big debate currently about chat GBT and about the impact on, you know, journal board meetings. We're having those conversations as well. I'm quite excited about maybe looking into how AI, you know, again, how do we interpret AI from a kind of more localized community perspective? And, you know, how does AI sort of compare to kind of more sort of contextualized collective intelligences, you know, from, from sort of that come through problem solving, et cetera. So, so that's definitely one thing that I'd like to kind of start sort of thinking about in a more structured fashion. And I do believe it's a trend. I think it's, I think people out there are already doing some interesting work on it. The other thing is around, is around data politics. You mentioned storytelling. So this is my big passion is around storytelling as a form of knowledge generation. One of the one of the and in fact it comes up as quite a big theme in my book in the chapter on social mobilization. I re- I was looking at a, a social justice organization in Cape Town that advocates for inclusionary housing. And I looked at their use of social media and I found that storytelling was quite a, a powerful framing device in terms of, you know, getting their their message out there. So I, I was also recently at a conference on post-colonial infrastructures and storytelling came up there as a device to understand how infrastructures work or do not work. So so I, I'm sort of loving the notion, you know, I think that is kind of becoming more and more prominent and, and it's helped by the data feminism, you know, sort of more reflective approach to data that's emerging. I think those, that's, I definitely think that's important and I think it's going to become even more interesting as time progresses. So I would say those are two areas. And then also just I think there's there's interesting work to be done just really, you know, around infrastructure. I mean, I I, I teach a lot of infrastructure-based stuff and practice my specialization in my teaching. So, you know, how how infrastructure and platform and digital technologies are becoming more and more intertwined. And I, I, I don't think it's necessarily a new research space, but I think it's it's one worth keeping an eye on in terms of practice. And, uh, you know, so that will be fun. Yeah, but yeah. some good stuff coming out. I mean, there's some wonderful work in the smart space. It's so much more interesting than it was 10 years ago, actually. Yeah, I agree. And I think, yeah, more nuanced and interesting conversations, you know, starting to happen mm. and the Absolutely. research being done. Absolutely. And I was just looking up data feminism. Mm-hmm. I've heard of it. Um, Now I've got to put it back on my reading list. I feel like I'm, I, yeah. 
Anyway, it's on you my probably list. Probably come across it, Zoe, without yeah. yeah it's it's yeah. so it's it's downloadable. It's ah source. yes. Sorry, I'm just yeah. looking at the yeah. author's name and I recognize that name. Mm. Um, yeah, Ignacio and uh, Ignacio and and yes. Klein. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I read Invisible Women a while ago, and yeah, that was also super eye-opening. I mean, fantastic, again, isn't it? It is, and it's not necessarily. Mm. It wasn't surprising, but well, some of the, some mm. of the stuff was surprising, but just so fascinating, interesting, and just getting people to think a bit differently with that gendered lens is mm. so important because absolutely, yeah, it's we we'll probably do a whole, you know. We can do a whole podcast episode on that. <laughs> yes. But we do have to wrap up soon. So let's yes. just quickly go to where to next for smart communities. I think the hybrid nature of smart communities is going to become more granular. Mm. I think the sort of offline stuff is going to continue, you know, the sort of old fashioned street committee work, social mobilization, etc. But I think that's going to become increasingly combined with sort of digital tools or platform tools or AI tools, in fact, that will become sort of more and more available in the public domain. So I think it's going to be a super interesting space, but I don't think it's going to be necessarily an expansion. I think it's going to be a a sort of more... Yeah, it's going to become more and more finely grained mm, and, like and perhaps even more effective. Yeah, deeper and, and perhaps even more effective in relation to, you know, what communities may organize around. And it, it, not necessarily mm. hectic activism. You know, it can just be around sort of creating a community garden, which is a form of activism in a way, you know. <laughs> but creating a community garden could become something interesting, for example. Mm. So yeah. I, I think it's a very interesting area of work to think about more and to do some work in. Yeah, as you were talking there, I think um, the accessibility of tools and data into the public mm. realm has then enables that intertwining, right? Like before mm. only, you know, I mean, it, we saw it happen with computers, with telephones, you know, those mm. type of things. And I think these next this next iteration if we work on it, is you know exactly mm. like what you said earlier around like that technology isn't the divider mm. of like you know the mm. haves and have nots. It's actually that mm. integrator, and that happens when more like tools become more accessible, making them easier to use and those type of things. But the questioning then has to come in because you still want that level of rigor underneath of like yeah. you know yeah. making sure that people are protected, but then also mm. that the the answers that we're getting are the best answers mm. that we can get with all those you know the bias and all those type yeah. of things. So yeah. again, another thing, another thing we mm. could definitely unpack in more detail yeah. Yeah. as well. There's mm. lots to talk about, Zoe. <laughs> there is. We'll have to get you back on the podcast, Nancy. It's been so great to have you back on again. Yeah, no, thank you. I've loved the conversation. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Well, thanks so much for sharing your book with us as well. Mm. Please send me the link of where people can find it and then we'll put that. We'll yes, sure that I will. Yeah, it's, it's, it was published by Bristol University Press. I'll, I'll send you the link. That would be awesome. To, um, but just the, well, the page. Yeah, and we can put the link in the show notes. Um, mm. That'll yeah. be great. Thanks. I'd love that. Yeah. One last question. How can people connect with mm. you? So I am available, obviously, on email, nancy.woodendahl at uct.ac.za. I'm on, uh, I'm not terribly good at using social media for professional purposes, but I am available on Instagram as Nomadic Nancy for obvious reasons. And I am on Facebook under my name. So I kind of use social media as a mix of um, personal and private and, and, and also professional, you know, it's sort of. I'm not terribly good on LinkedIn, so it's probably best to, fo- to find me on email. Our web address for the department is apg.uct.ac.za. So my profile, my research profile is on that. Excellent. We will put those links in the show notes as well so people can click away cool. and find you. A massive thanks Fantastic. again for coming on the podcast. Thank you. Um, I really enjoy this Thank conversation. You. Lovely and to then see I see you again see all these other conversations that we need to have spurning off yeah. this one as well um Sounds but yes good so great to see you again and yeah we'll yeah great to see you again yeah Thanks. absolutely keep well thank we'll you for the soon. invitation bye talk soon ciao
The Smart Community Podcast is brought to you by My Smart Community. If you're trying to deal with disruption, not sure what technologies to buy, need to facilitate genuine collaboration, then we can help. Email hello at mysmart.community or head to www.mysmart.community forward slash consulting. Thanks so much for listening to the Smart Community Podcast. Show notes for this episode and all other episodes are available on our website, mysmart.community slash podcast. If you have any questions for us or any of our guests, you can email hello at mysmart.community. You can also find us on the socials. We are on LinkedIn and Twitter at smartcomhq. That's com with two M's. If you are enjoying the podcast, please hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. And we would love for you to leave us a rating and review at wherever you listen. This really helps us reach more ears and eyes. So thank you for your support. As always, we hope you enjoyed listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. Smart Community Podcast is what you're looking for.